Today's episode of Shebrew in the City is brought to you by Top Dog Tours. Whether you're visiting Toronto, Boston, Philadelphia, or New York City, we've got something for everybody. Visit us at topdogtours.com to book your tour today and follow us on social media for any special offers and discounts. If you like what you hear and want to hear more of it, you can subscribe and also follow me on Instagram at She Brew in the City to see what my life is like day to day. I'm also on Patreon if you'd like to have access to some special episodes and offers. והייתי לך שלא, מה הייתי לך שלא, קח אותי על הגמל. I'm your beauty, oh my beast, welcome to the Middle East. תל אביבי, החביבי תל אביב, תסתכל כמה לירדים מסביב. עושים לי איי איי, בלילה וואי וואי, וסחטיין התל אביב, תל אביבי החביבי תל אביב, תסתכל כמה לירדים מסביב. עושים לי איי איי, בלילה וואי וואי, וסחטיין התל אביב. Hi, this is Shebrew in the City. I'm Nicole Kelly, and today I am talking to Cantor Stefano Iacono. How are you doing this uh, lovely morning? I'm doing well. This is, um, if, if something is usually after your bedtime, what is it when it is before your wake-up time? <laughs> I don't know. We should come up with a word for that. But I feel like that's most of the day for me. Fair. <laughs> Can you make sure not to tell the senior clergy that I said that, though? <laughs> I, I know Rabbi Ben was already in his office when we got here, and he was in Washington, D.C. yesterday. And then the night before, he had a – he's crazy. I don't – It's need, incredible. I need whatever he is – vitamins he is taking. So I'm really excited to talk to you. When we were kind of pitching the idea of the podcast, you were actually one of the first people I thought of as a guest because you have such an interesting and beautiful and unique story that I think a lot of people – would be interested in hearing about or possibly relate to. So kind of jumping in, in regards to your relationship with music, you you play the guitar and you have an amazing voice. When did you first become interested in music? Was it something that you're, was kind of cultivated within your house? Is it something that you were the first person in your family to be interested in that? How did that come about? So I didn't grow up with other musicians in the family, but I have been annoying them with my own music since I think I was like two and a half, Michael Jackson's Black or White on MTV was my jam. And <laughs> I would go around the house making up words to it. And from there, you know, I just, I never really stopped singing. And I started writing music in elementary school and realized that I wanted to be able to accompany myself. I started playing piano. And in my first example of vanity that I look back on and now laugh was that I hated not being able to take the piano with me. Oh. I was jealous of my friends who could sit down with the guitar and just sort of, you know, pick up and play anywhere yeah. they went. Uh, and so out of spite, uh, I learned how to play guitar and it became my <laughs> primary love. <laughs> and I just never put it down. I feel most comfortable. It's an extension of my body. You know, I breathe with my guitar and um, I sit at home and I write with my guitar and it's funny, I don't, I don't always listen to music, but I'm always making music. It just, it comes out of me. And so I needed to channel it into something. And the circuitous path that led me to the cantorate, I'm, I'm very grateful for it because this is the culmination of all the things I love. It's amazing you found a job that kind of, like you said, has all different aspects of all the things that you really love and feel connected to. When did you start playing the guitar? So I was in high school. Okay. And I just, you know, was very uh, frustrated that my friends could do their thing and I wanted to join the party. So I picked it up 
and, you know, within a couple of years was picking up gigs at coffee shops, playing covers and sharing overly personal, uh, <laughs> emotional <laughs> music. Like imagine bad dashboard confessional, mm. um, like, but without a backup band. <laughs> so I mean, we're talking tragic, just comically bad oversharing, but it grew from there and I would play bars and restaurants and invariably by like hour two and a half, someone who did not get the message that I'm playing Jewel and Alanis Morissette songs would start screaming for Freebird. Um, <laughs> and I'm like, sir, I, I just sang You're not Tracy taking Chapman. Requ- I'm not taking requests. <laughs> right. And, and, and I'm like, read, read, read the room. Uh, like that's, that's not what's coming out of me today. Um, but needless to say, it was something I enjoyed doing. Um, and it was not the right fit. Mm. Uh, I wasn't able to bring the audiences of Central Texas uh, what they wanted. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised they weren't requesting Christian rock music. Or we went we went to a wedding and in Texas. It's the only time I've ever been to Texas, and we were waiting for the wedding to start. And there was definitely like Christian rock. And I was like, this only makes me slightly uncomfortable. Positive, <laughs> encouraging. And what was ironic is the groom was Jewish. So um, oh, yeah. I was like, "There's this is a very interesting presentation of music, considering that one of the people who's getting married is not is not Christian. Oh, for sure. And, you know, that's one of the interesting things of Texas. You'll find out that some of like the startup bands that then get famous, like Sixpence None the Richer, you know, kiss me. Yeah. Oh, down I by am the a millennial. Uh, yes. And so it's that's like, from, from uh, <laughs> She's All That. That was, a, that was mm-hmm. a very important moment for all millennial girls was her coming down the stairs with of that course. song. And they are, surprise, a Christian rock band. They are not. Yes. That's so crazy. Yes. Lifehouse. <laughs> Um, dare you to move? You know that yeah. that that piece. Same thing. There. I know that the Christian rock movement is a very lucrative movement, and I was looking at the Grammy nominations this past week, and there's lots of different categories within Christian music. Mm-hmm. I know there's a huge movement. We need to make. We need to get. Is there a Jewish music Grammy category? And if not, we need to get on top of that. I think we fall in world. World. Because we because we are all over the world. <laughs> or I'm gonna I'm gonna let that be the frame. Okay. I know I was gonna go somewhere else with that, but I was like, I'm not gonna be repeating anti Semitic tropes on my podcast. Um okay, so G- Grammy nomination committee, let's get on the Jewish music, though I feel like Debbie Friedman probably would have won every year Always. while she was alive. Um, so you said you also played piano. Do you still, do you have like a keyboard in your house? I see, you know, I see one in your office. So so you still actively play piano? Yes. And I am embarrassingly as bad of a student now as I was in fifth grade. Um, I just don't practice enough. Everyone who plays piano other than literally professional musical directors and pianists says that. And I was try- someone tried to teach me to play piano and I was like, this is not my journey. Yeah. But, you know, I feel like every adult I talk to is like, I need to practice more. Yes. It's like there are too many options. What, 81? Is that is that the number of choices? Like a guitar has six strings. Leave me alone. Like that's it's a little bit more simple. It <laughs> that's makes enough sense. choices for me. <laughs> makes sense. Do you play any other instruments or have interest in learning any other instruments? I have always wanted to play flute. I've always wanted to play ukulele. I wanted to play French horn. And I was like, oh, cool. Each of these is a completely different modality. Yeah, yeah. Let me let, let me devote another corner of my life yeah, to picking up this a, skill. a whole thing. The ukulele is similar enough to the guitar. I think that it would be easy to pick up. And yeah. it's very portable. So, you know, you you can literally take it with you everywhere, um, which is not, what's nice about the ukulele. And there's lots of different types of ukuleles. Patrick plays the ukulele. And um, in our old apartment, when we had a little more wall space. They were all displayed on the wall. Like it was a music store. Yes. Um, like we That's literally the had the uh, industrial like hangers that they have at like a tar center. And I'm hoping someday we'll have an apartment again where we can hang them because it was really cool. So you so you also write songs. And you talked about starting to do that. You know, when did you learn to read and write music? And what were some of your early songs about if you started so young? I want to know, you know, were they about the strife that you were going through as an elementary school kid or, you know. I wrote pop songs you wrote as an pop elementary songs school. As an uh, yes. school kid. Yeah, you know, I I loved pop music. I what lo- were some of your favorite pop artists other than um, Michael Jackson, like you said? Yeah, for sure. Um, mid to late '90s, I was all about the Spice Girls. 
I loved the yes. idea that they wrote their own five part harmonies. <laughs> I I was with the posh spice at the bottom. She sounds Indeed. like a bass if you listen to the music. She literally sounds like a bass. <laughs> oh God, love her. We love, we love, we love, we love posh. Um, but uh, you know it, that that was really the format that I learned to write in. Otherwise, I was listening to whatever my parents were listening to, the Cranberries, Counting Crows. Um, and so I learned song structure from like um, adult alternative. Mm -hmm. um, but then I translated it through, you know, Britney Spears, um, Spice Girls, Backstreet Boys, finding out, you know, here's here's the right number of verses into a chorus, into a bridge, a refrain, and then going there. And it was always love songs. A topic that no eight-year-old knows anything about. Um, <laughs> There's some adults that don't know anything about it, so I think <laughs> you're fine there. But, you know, just um, things like heartbreak. I, I loved writing about heartbreak. And, and it just, <laughs> it makes no sense. But it, in a way, it's one of the most universal concepts in most songs. Most songs are about love of something, usually a person, sometimes, you know, food or... <laughs> Indeed. Uh, and, or, or something like that. But I feel like I've had moments of revelation where I'm like, oh, most songs are about relationships because everybody, at, for the most part, has relationships and it is a universal thing people can understand. Right. I feel like we would have been friends when we were in elementary school because we listened to the same music and I was also <laughs> like overly serious. I feel like I was in such a hurry to grow up because I wanted to be taken seriously. And yes. shocking, I'm still not taken seriously. So it was the it's the sad truth of me trying to grow up. So I feel like I need to impart on my daughter. It's like, no one's going to take you seriously. Just have some fun, be a kid. Yes. Because I was like, I'm reading adult books and I'm watching adult movies and I want to be, you know, I want to be an adult. I was in such a rush. And now oh, yeah. I have to pay taxes um, <laughs> and, you know, worry about things like that. We just got the email from our CPA being like, this is how much money you owe to the government. And I'm like, government, I don't want to give you my money. <laughs> if only I could be eight again and writing I know, love songs. I, it, it, writing, you know, love songs, <laughs> listening to the Spice Girls. Um, you know, did you like the Spice Girls movie? What are your thoughts on the movie? My um, sister, my sister still talks about it frequently, like at least every month or so it kind of comes up in conversation. So I think I can say objectively that it was cinema perfection um and i think it will stand the test of time <laughs> like that feels like an objective statement to me I, you know for a certain age group of people i think that's true <laughs> maybe for my parents not so much but definitely for the millennial especially the geriatric millennials which is a term i love because you know i remember before the internet and when people got newspapers delivered but i also now have a smartphone mm -hmm. so i feel like for the geriatric millennial spice world was a very formative film alan cumming is fantastic oh, yeah. in it and there's smart jokes and you know it's it's about girl power which i think if i'm being honest the spice girls were probably the first time i was introduced to like feminism mm -hmm. i mean you can make fun of mm -hmm. all that but it was it was about feminism and i think it introduced that to a lot of young women and men and I think that's super important so it is a classic film and it should obviously be put in the Library of Congress as yes. um, <laughs> important to I don't know well they're not American but what is it to get from the Library of Congress it has to be like important to American culture in some way but I if 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 we could make that happen I think it's important to preserve that yeah. history and I'm, well, not, and I'm only like 5% joking <laughs> I'm happy to submit all of the videos of me being a perfect sporty spice to show the impact it had on American culture. Like, you know, it, it just really. And, you know, the thing is, they were smart. They were. They were smart. And I don't know if we realize that. Today. I distinctly remember, like, they used to sell Spice Girls candy. Like they were they were smart and they were also making money for being yes. smart. So, you know, I don't I can't really think of another music group that sold candy with their faces on it. So <laughs> <laughs> Lady Gaga got her Oreos. Yes. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, she's also smart and also um, a queer icon because mm -hmm. I feel like the Spice Girls are. And maybe we're Big like, time. I'm not queer, so I can't speak to this. But maybe like early icons for young queer people and being like, I love their fabulousness. Oh, yeah. Because um, they were they were pretty fabulous. So speaking of being smart and career in music, you talked about playing coffee houses and restaurants in Texas. Did you ever think of moving to a place like Nashville or Los Angeles and just pursuing song singing and songwriting as your main career? Oh, yeah. There was a plan for the whole family to uproot and move to Seattle. For oh, a while. my goodness. Seattle, which I found out like last year was the seat of a lot of bands in the 90s. Mm -hmm. I clearly was not paying attention because mm -hmm. I only found that out. And I, you know, part of me may have been chasing that 
that feel. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to be in a, you know, a grungy space um, and then do my twist. I had kind of a, a folksy twang to my voice, mm-hmm. um, but I, you know, modeled everything I did after Alanis Morissette's Jagged Little Pill. Yes. And did you see the musical? No, I did not. Very serious for a, even for a musical. I didn't see it, I but I know d- the, pl- the plot. And I was like, I don't know if I, I want to bring the 90s angst. Yeah. yeah. That's what we need right now. <laughs> I can't imagine it translating and I can't imagine it being watchable today. Like it's just because it's it's not even cynical. Well, it was happening. It, it, it came out like like it technically qualified for the Tonys after COVID. And Patrick was like, that's what we need right now in this post-COVID world is 90s angst. Right? It's like, no, we've got Olivia <laughs> Rodrigo. She's bringing the updated version of it. But yeah, but like, I mean, we there's really definitely a there, space for I also really enjoyed Lance Marsalt music as a child. There's definitely a space for an eight year old to be belting. You want to know? Um, yeah. But <laughs> as I did, <laughs> I mean, yes. Again, I feel like we would have been friends. We should like go back in time and become pen pals. Maybe our parents can have the same conversations with us together about why we shouldn't sing that in the grocery store. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just think we remember I had a babysitter for part of elementary school and I was belting unbreak my heart in the car and she was like laughing and I was like, I don't understand why this is funny um, because I I took singing very seriously in the car and I still do. So I, I hope my daughter, who also is already at like two and a half, like trying to belt and sing like um, Julie Andrews, that she will sing inappropriate music. God because bless. I feel like it is a is a rite of passage. So going back to what we're actually talking about. <laughs> um, so you were planning on moving to Seattle. Why did that? Why didn't that end up happening? Well, to be honest, I um, started to get a little good at music. Okay. Um, and realized that I was hating it. I I loved performing and sharing and getting very emotional and being deep in my feelings and and then creating something that was supposed to be beautiful, but I didn't want to do it for strangers every day anymore. Mm. And it just, I wanted something a little more reciprocal. I I didn't want an audience. I wanted, I don't know. A community. A community. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. It can be a little isolating being a performer because it's like the other and then they leave and then you never see them again. And there's no, you know, unless you know, you somehow have some sort of like stage door experience. There's no communication about the experience. Mm, no. Performing can also be really great because of that, mm-hmm. because sometimes you want to just <clears throat> do it and then leave. But like, but if you want, if your whole MO is to connect to people, that it can be very isolating. Yeah. Especially because not all audiences are respectful. <clears throat> so. <laughs> For sure. I can definitely imagine that being the case if you're working in restaurants and bars and people are, you know, not paying attention or being obnoxious. That would be frustrating. And it, it really hurt me in the beginning. Yeah. Um, but even even that, you know, you kind of get over it. But then you realize there's there's only so far that creating something in that space can go when it's just you. Yeah. And it's just not what I wanted to pour my to energy into. Have a collaborative into. community experience. Yeah. And it takes so long to come down from performance. You know, once you're really in it, like there's there's no chance you're going to bed. Yeah, I I feel like that's why I still keep actor hours because after shows I we would go out to like TGI Fridays and I get home at like four a.m. and I've never really left that. But that's a problem because my daughter has to be at school at eight forty five. Exactly. So I usually Life just calls. like throw on clothes and look like a troll, and I'm like, you know, trying to get her her hair done, and I'm like, okay, we're doing this. But then I'm now awake, so I can't go back to sleep. Yeah. Look, I'm a worrier. And so I had to have a very frank conversation with myself one day. I was like, okay, what if you did achieve your goal? What if one day you are touring all over the world and you have a band who backs you up and you have management and this and this and that? You're going to really sleep in a different place every day. Hopefully you sleep and you're going to get up and you're going to do your press tours and you're going to do your thing. And you're never going to do anything else and you're going to have to always be in top-notch condition yeah. for a performance that's not doing it for you anymore. Yeah. It, it can it be just... – I mean, there is something I think some people, you know, I don't know why I'm thinking of Taylor Swift, but, like, there's a high you can get from performance oh, absolutely. in that way. And I think a lot of people chase that high. But, it can, again, it can be very isolating. It can be exhausting. I don't know when this is going to air, but I was just at the D.C. March for Israel and against anti-Semitism, and I had to leave it 
6 a.m. and got back at 11. And that's, you know, like a touring day. And I didn't even give a show. So I, I totally get where you're coming from. So speaking of writing songs, I absolutely love the story about how you told your husband you <laughs> loved him because it's very creative. And um, I would love if you would share that story with us. Absolutely. Um, so, Well, how did you meet your husband? So we met in Texas on Gay.com way okay. back when it was a city chat room based MySpace. Oh, we're going MySpace. back to chat room Oh, yeah. And era, you know, yes. this is before apps. This is like in the dawning of online dating. This is 2010. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and so we ended up having conversations like i said is you know big chat rooms so everyone in town is in this chat room and you're talking about all sorts of things and um i was a bit of a know-it-all uh and so was he and i had a pretentious streak you know trying to you know make a name for myself in the world <laughs> it, i can it, i can say it was cute now um but it was insufferable then and um yeah out of the blue he sent me a message and said hey do you do you want to meet at this bar and, you know, I had just turned 21. He wasn't even 21 yet. So we're sitting on the picnic table outside this historic space that was once a Jewish community center and is now like a three-story queer bar. Um, and he's <laughs> in got Texas. These, yeah, in Texas. And he's got I, this sounds big like a set up to a joke. <laughs> I know. Every part of it. Every part of it. I love so that crazy. they were like former JCC. Obviously, this needs to be a gay bar. Of course. Um, and so it's got these like, you know, the stars of David uh, on the cornices everywhere. And it's beautiful. And people are just like getting down to the latest, <laughs> you know, it, like, I, I can I can I can see uh, people dancing to Kylie Minogue. Like, you know, if that's I, the vibe. Does this place still exist? Because if it does, I feel like I need to make a trip specifically oh, yeah. to go there. The Bonham Exchange. <laughs> yes, it's on Bonham and Houston in San Antonio, I believe. Um, and it, it is still there. It's still thriving. I will be looking this up and maybe making a journey to Texas <laughs> just to take some Instagram photos and be like, yes. Um, and the best part is that, you know, we were, we were sitting outside of this space and just happened to be having the most serious conversation. And we talked about literature. You know, we went from like, I know why the caged bird sings to what were the foundational texts that you read at way too young of an age that traumatized you? And, you know, and then, <laughs> it, then, and then it turns to Judaism. And so it just, it, it was, it was a shocking first conversation with someone who I admittedly um, had not impressed mm. online. Um because, you know, we, we butted heads. Like I said, I was a know-it-all. I was always on a soapbox. I was very, very politically active in those days and convinced that people just weren't doing enough. Um, and just it, it worked. It, we just spoke from the heart and I calmed down for a second. And it must have been the only calm couple <laughs> of hours of my life. And uh, I just remember thinking this feels like a really bad movie. Like, what are the odds that we would be sitting outside of this bar and, you know, come out to each other as people who are interested in converting to Judaism? Like, it, it still just sounds fake. One could say possible beshert. Yeah. I mean, that's how I see it now. But yeah. obviously in the moment, I was just like, uh, did you read something did you know that about me like why did that come up like today i would have definitely been suspicious that someone had been on my social media and was like trying to gaslight <laughs> me or was, something this was before you could fit you could stalk somebody online oh yeah so we had myspace and myspace only like, I know, and myspace was like a place for showcasing your favorite song or you know kind of pitting your friends against each other about who you liked the most oh yeah i think facebook had like just started being a thing and it was just publicly. for college students oh yeah yes i remember mm -hmm. this and I went to a performing arts college, so I couldn't get a Facebook because we didn't get we didn't have college emails, mm -hmm. and that was kind of the prerequisite for that. Yep. So you you meet your husband, and you fall hard. And how do you tell him that you love him? About two months in, um, I realized the feelings were just intense. Um, and when I can make up my mind, it's it's very definite. And I wrote this song called "I Found Love." Um, and it came from one night when we were asleep, I 
made sure he was asleep. And I said, uh, I love you. But I was studying Hebrew at the time. And I was still afraid that even if he was awake, he'd hear me and know what I was saying. And so I said, Ani ohev And um, it was my favorite moment of my life so far. And I decided to put that in a song. And so I sing this like, you know, dramatic, I found love, la 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 song. And the very last line um, is the, you know, I drop that I whispered this in your ear as you were sleeping. Um, and instead of, you know, calling him and saying, hey, I love you or, you know, dropping that on a date or something, I sent him an MP3 <laughs> of the demo. <laughs> Just, like, I, I, I emailed it to him. Yeah, I didn't even say anything about it. Um, and then what was it? Three minutes and 48 seconds or something later, he called me and I did not pick up. <laughs> When you woke, I just couldn't find the words. But I told your pillow so sweetly, and nobody, nobody was hurt. But where, where do we go? Yes, I found love hiding on cover, hiding on mother. I was hiding from you. I want to hold you. Did you hear that? Well, I said I love you. Oh, you know I do.
you were like, I feel like this was a common thing, um, that especially like very long time ago, you know, using the internet, being like, I did something I'm going to, I don't think it was a good idea and yep. I'm just going to pretend that it didn't happen. Felt cute, might delete later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's yes. very much that. And to this day, he makes fun of me for it. And it's the best thing to be teased over because I was just like, you know, this is the truth and I want you to know. But also, oh, God, what if he doesn't feel this way? You know, what if this is too much and I lose it all? Um, but it it was going to be worth it. I had to let him know. And then, you know, the second time he called when I did answer, he said, I love you, too. And um, I was like, okay, what now? Yeah. <laughs> like, who said this was the next step? Yeah, yeah. And this was before gay marriage was legal, obviously. Oh, yeah. So it would have been like, okay, do we, you know. I mean, this was before people had boyfriends on TV in prime time. Like, and, and it was still just not very accepted. By 2010, you know, we're like, Don't Ask, Don't Tell was still in play yeah. When we were dating. And that was just the culture. You tried not to stick out. And, and any time you had pride, people would be angry about it because what are you what are you tr- going on about? What are you trying to shove in people's face and show that you're different then and your different is good? And so then if your difference is a good thing, are you saying you're better than others? It, it was it was nonsense. But yeah, I lived in California when Prop 8 was a huge mm. thing. And it, it was just kind of. Yeah. Scary how for no reason people I don't know, maybe this is because I'm Jewish and, you know, I I'm not a terrible person. I don't think what other people do affects me in that way. So I don't I've never really understood that. People didn't want to see the institution change. People didn't want to have to think. Because marriage is such, you know, I know uh, know, with the high divorce rate and people cheating. And And I I love to joke. I I mean, I even let our kids know, please don't let anyone ever tell you that you should have a biblical marriage. Read the text. That it's is not just good. not yeah, how we not, get married. Yeah, today. it's men sleeping with their wives' servants to have <clears> children, <throat> mm-hmm. and yeah, it's yeah, it's not a good basis for that. So, speaking of the Bible, um, tell can you tell me where you are originally from? I know you said you're from Texas, and what your religious upbringing was like. I'm from San Antonio, Texas, um, which I love to remind people is the sixth largest city in the country. It Ooh. is an amazing place. I love. Love, love my hometown. Um, if we could put it in Brooklyn, I would still live there. Um, and I, it, because it was such a big town, it is predominantly Catholic. Okay, and I then didn't know that. the other half is some kind of Protestant, mostly evangelical. Um, very, very small Jewish community of which I was not yet part. Mm-hmm. Um, I was raised knowing that we were people who called ourselves non-denominational Christians. See that to me. We call it Christian with a capital C, Mm. which is, you know, the crazy born again people. Mm -hmm. So when I hear Mm non-denominational, I think of ultra religious Christian people, like the Quiverful movement. And really what it is, is making sure that you don't have to apply a label. It is just and and, and that's why there's so much room for it being, you know, um, diplomatic words here um, for it being an exercise in fundamentalism or in being something very open. Mm. And we fell more on the open side, mostly because we didn't affiliate. Um, so my mom comes from a long line of Pentecostal ministers, and that that didn't fit her okay. anymore. And so she she stopped um, practicing, I, I think, early, early in life with her family. Um, and my dad immigrated from Italy when he was in middle school, and his whole family is Roman Catholic. And he really struggled with his faith. And the way it was practiced in his family. So my parents made the conscious decision not to raise us formally anything. So we knew the name because in Texas, people would ask. Like, they ask, you know, now what school do you go to? What do you do? What church do you go to? Um, what a and, weird intro question. And, you know, but but it's it, it asks, where's your community based? And, and you know, it, and it's not a question about how religious are you and what kind of religious are you, but... Where do you go when you're sad? Where do you bring food when something happens in the community? So it's so like it, it it makes sense. It's just not the precise question. So we had to have an answer, but it wasn't an answer for fit. Today, my mom says that she raised us secular. Mm. She would never have used that word back then. Um, 
because it, you know, it meant atheist, which is also not what secular means. Yeah. Um, but it meant that we had the room to explore and my parents expected us to explore. And then I did. I loved the Bible. I really was fascinated with the idea of this ancient text that we carried and update and, and still have a relationship with. Um, and I got very into the New King James version of the Bible, and, and I would just read and read. And partially because I had heard that there were these handful of verses about why being gay was a sin and I was going to go to hell. And so I was obsessed with that concept, and I had to know everything about it. And so I was mostly reading it as a litigator. I, I needed to know what was being said about me in this book that was being weaponized and following me my entire life. And ultimately I found out like they don't have a case. Like it just doesn't yeah, it doesn't Yeah, there's a lot of things that, that they're like it says this in the Bible and I'm like it also says not to wear mixed fabrics, but you know, it, yeah. I don't think that's something we're also following. Yeah. It it ended up like showing me that my my greatest passion in life was going to be getting in the heads of biblical authors. Being like, what in the world did that mean? What were they so scared of? Why couldn't you mix these two fabrics? What did it mean if you did? And why would that get you shunned and expelled and, you know, whatever else? Um, and I needed to know why something that I didn't think was bad about myself was going to get me in hell, which was a place that I couldn't really find any reason why it needed to exist. And that was that was my religiosity. It was always trying to find some answer because I was shown a worldview that said this faith always has an answer. Which it does and that's one of the things I love about Judaism, maybe because I'm I'm an intellectual. Um <laughs> because I like to question things and I'm mm -hmm. like why? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and that's, I think, one of the cornerstones of Judaism is questioning yeah. and trying to grapple with these questions. And that leads me to my next question. What was your first exposure to Judaism mm -hmm. being, you know, in Texas where there obviously are Jews, you know, we, mm -hmm. we say, we're everywhere. Because, um, you know, like the world music. Um, <laughs> 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 so what was your first exposure to Judaism? Did you meet someone who was Jewish? How did you hear about Judaism? You know, mm -hmm. I... I, I like to say that I didn't really meet people who weren't Jewish until I was five. So kind of maybe the opposite experience of what you had. Yeah. Around the time that I was starting to realize that I was gay. So in elementary school, mm -hmm. I, I was very aware. I was put in after school care at the JCC, which was right next door to my neighborhood. And it was mostly because it was convenient. And my parents really they thought everyone there who worked there was really lovely and nice. And the hours lined up with what they needed. <laughs> Practical reasons. Yep. Um, and then, you know, we lit Shabbat candles every Friday and we ate challah and I got to learn about what this was. And one of my best friends started sharing her, her relationship, not, not even her beliefs, but her relationship with her religion with me. And I was fascinated because what I had was belief. What I did not have was practice. There was, there was no version of Christianity that I was practicing and I was like, what do you mean? There are things that you do. My Protestant family was so scared of ritual. They were literally nervous about the Catholic side of my family inserting things or, or doing. And it turns out both sides were actually very nervous about <laughs> religious difference. So surprise, having a, a, a convert in the middle of things um, really spices it up. But I loved that Judaism allowed for questioning. That was the first thing. Because when I said that, you know, what I was raised in presented itself as with the answers, the first thing I learned about Judaism was that it does not. And it will not. There's, there, it's, it's extremely rare to read anything in modernity that says, here is what it is. Rather, here are the years of tradition, years of interpretation, the years of expanding the practice to mean something. And we are always reading between the lines and trying to figure out what was the point. That makes more sense to me. That is an active engagement in something. And I wanted to be someone whose religion does something. And, and so 
when I found out, you know, you've got these rituals and then, and, you know, of course I was a kid. So Hanukkah just seemed incredible. And I loved that the calendar moved, you know, because I didn't really understand <laughs> at the time yeah. how the <laughs> Hebrew calendar didn't have anything to do with the Gregorian calendar. But it seemed exciting. Like you never knew when a holiday was going <laughs> to fall on you. Which <laughs> Stressful as an adult, but fun as a kid, I guess. Yeah. And I feel like every time I'd come back, there would be some new thing they were doing. Well, there's so many holidays. There's so it's, many holidays. It's an obscene amount of holidays. But, you know, you live by a calendar. And and I wanted that. I wanted to have something that was going to be an active part in my every day. And, you know, every Jew, every Passover has to decide whether or not to do it. You have to reconcile your life with that date on the calendar. Whether you are sitting at an Orthodox Seder or you are, you know, I don't know, meat, eating matzo ball soup at Katz's, I, 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 you are choosing whether or not to do the thing that all of the Jews are doing. Like that is an active participation that I didn't have in my religious identity growing up. And I'm grateful for that because it left room for exploration. When did you decide to officially convert? Is it something that just kind of was always there and you didn't realize it was an option or was it something that when you became a little bit older, you were like, well, I'm going to go through with this process? So for the longest time, I did not know it was an option. I thought I was like, you thought oh. you had to be born Jewish. Yeah. I, I thought I will be someone who has a love for Judaism, who reads Judaism. I never thought I would be going to synagogues. I thought that would be off limits to me. And I also didn't know about reform Judaism. You know, I, I read the entire shelf at Barnes & Noble on Judaism. <laughs> and, and guess what doesn't make an appearance Reform Judaism, which is— Surprise. No, well, back then, yes. <laughs> I feel like reform, the reform movement is much more is much more prevalent now. but And yeah, visible. Yeah, it yeah. is much more visible. And then finding out that actually all of the Jews that I knew, all my friends in school were reform Jews. It, it, it was funny to, to not have grasped that. And so it was a couple of years of, you know— shopping around at different houses of worship, you know, we tried the Unitarian Universalists, we went to the Hindu temple, we we tried several versions of Christianity, modern progressive movements, and some traditional stuff. And ultimately, we felt the most at home in the Reform Synagogue in San Antonio. Now, mind you, I had absolutely no idea what was happening the first time I gathered the courage to go. You know, fully two years after I had realized Judaism was the path for me. That's how long it took me to come to synagogue. But the first time I heard my cantor chant the Chatzikadosh, I was like, there, there is something in this melody that's carrying a history of experience that is both intensely particular and just incredibly universalistic. Because when I was reading the words, I was like, there's nothing in here that anybody I know couldn't say I'm into. And, and I just, I'd never experienced what I call a backward compatible religion. I, I was like, you know, if I shared this prayer book with my grandma, this very devout Catholic woman who to this day is, is just like one of the best Catholics that I know. <laughs> she gets the award. I'd show this to her and, and I know she would see God in it. Like she would understand um, what we were doing. I'm still wowed by that. I'm it, it's interesting that you talked about the music being a connection because I feel like sometimes when I'm at services, it's almost like a primal connection to mm -hmm. the music. So I definitely understand that. Can you walk me through the steps of uh, reform conversion? Uh, I recently found out from Rabbi Julie that you don't have to be told no three times. Indeed. Which, <laughs> uh, I, you know, is perpetuated through media. So what was the process from deciding you were going to convert to officially becoming a Jew? Um, for me, it was getting comfortable with my local synagogue. First, trying them all out. Went to the Orthodox synagogue. It was lovely. Went to the conservative synagogue. It was absolutely lovely. Went to Reform Synagogue and was like, okay, this is what's going to align both spiritually and at that time, like I said, it was very political and it was going to align politically yeah. with what I was looking for. Um, and so I, you know, started to attend, became a regular, got to know a couple of people um, and then, you know, asked what the options were. And they said, well, we've got an intro to Judaism class. So we signed up for the class. Um, it was... A weekly lecture series 
we did that for like eight months. And then there's a Hebrew component for like another six, six weeks. Um, and then you have a whole bunch of follow-up stuff. So you end up filling up an entire year. I want you to live the year according to the Hebrew calendar. Um, see what you're going to feel and experience at each of the holidays and important milestones so that you, you've tried it on fully before you commit. And you know it, it differs a little bit depending on where you go. But for the most part, it's a year of study and experience so that you know fully what you are choosing. And that's sort of where the tradition of being refused three times comes from. You have to really want this. Yeah, it's a major life decision. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a really big deal. And we're one of the few faiths that actually makes it not difficult because it's not supposed to be difficult, but makes it a process that you have to totally opt into over and over and over because, well, what we say here um, when we're educating um, potential converts is you're putting on a name tag that a lot of people have a pretty intense feelings about. And so you have to really be doing this because you're committed to it because it will change the way some people in the world interact with you. And hopefully it changes the lens with which you see the world. I know you and your husband converted together. Do you think that um, this process made it much more of a shared experience as opposed to something extremely personal? Yes. And I will be upfront with you. Um, I was initially a little uncomfortable with the question, chose not to say anything just because it's, you know, it's, it's such a private, like I choose to be very, very public yeah. um, with, with my process because I want to make sure people know that they can do this too. Um, we don't advertise. I mean, we don't, we don't, we don't proselytize, but I think we could advertise a little bit. Um, and, but it also converting with him was the, the, just the most intensely spiritual experience because we had completely different approaches to Judaism then and now. Um, our practices shift, our beliefs evolve and deepen, and we fell in love with different things at the start. I loved Talmud, <laughs> um, which just sounds crazy, <laughs> but I loved the sacredness in recording arguments and debate to make sure that if you got it wrong, you could go back later and be like, okay, well, the other thing we thought of <laughs> was this. So maybe we can, you know, tease that out a bit. Um, but I didn't convert for God. And this is as someone who prayed every single day, like with my family. And then, you know, before bed, my personal practice was also to pray. And, it, you know, it was, are you there, God? It's me, Margaret style prayer. Yeah. Um, and that came later. That came like a long time after learning the liturgy and being present in services that I picked up on that part of it. And um, it was just, it was incredibly special to be able to bounce ideas off of my husband and, and see, you know, what, what does this spark in you? Why does this move you? Because I loved being moved by all of it. Um, I wouldn't have changed anything. It, it's the most incredible process. And, and I firmly believe that that's why we have people like prospective converts today attend the class with their partners if they have a serious partner. Because it just, it is... Even um, if the partner is Jewish? Even if the partner is Jewish, yes. Because if one of you is going to dramatically change your life, your partner needs to witness it and needs to help you reintegrate everything that you are. Because you're not actually changing. You're changing the box. Like, you're, you are just affirming things that were going to come out through Judaism. You have, to, you have to be able to support each other through the process so that when you're done... You can meaningfully be Jewish. Like, what does it mean to be Jewish in your home? What's that going to look like for someone who didn't, you know, grow up with the music and, and grow up with this sense of I'm Jewish because? It's really hard to fill in that gap and, and, and learn what's going to be in your blank. Like, wh why? Why did you do it? It's the first thing everybody wants to ask you. And so you're going to need help workshopping that and, and, and exploring it. And I think the best way is with a partner. It's beautifully put. I think it can be like the way I've always kind of thought of it as a very isolated experience. But mm. I think, you it know, is. taking that journey with somebody is is a beautiful thing. Do you feel like you were always Jewish? You just happened to be born in a family that wasn't Jewish? It is so funny. Um, 
Because yes, in a way that I can't really explain. You know, one one day, and I, I can I can see where I was the morning I had this feeling. It was in front of my parents' old house in San Antonio. Um, one day I woke up, and it was the first day that I had a thought. Like, I, I, I recalled a memory from my childhood and just subconsciously referred to myself as Jewish mm. back then. Like... I felt like I had been a Jewish kid or it, it was like it was something deep within you that was always there. Yeah, it um it just it fits so well when I finally put it on that I thought maybe this was always there and I just never pulled it out and tried it for myself.
I also found out that a few years before his death, my grandpa shared all of these Jewish artifacts with me in like a, an old Tanakh that I have here in my office that was among his possessions. And he apparently had been similarly in love with Hebrew and the idea of Judaism. So I don't know. I think for people who are seeking, there's there's a magic to exploring faith and religion in general. And um, when I found that coat, I was just so excited for it to be mine. And one day a few years later, yeah, I, I woke up and it was as if there had never been a moment where I wasn't wearing it. The past was just harmonized, and um, I feel that way now. And it, I think that is still the weirdest part. It's so beautiful. You're making me cry. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a question that I've always been kind of curious about. I know a lot of you – obviously, when you convert, you are denouncing other religions. I know that's – you literally say that, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people who are not Jewish, Christmas is a huge deal for mm. them. And I talk to people whose, you know, husbands have converted and, you know, I, you know, almost like mourning the loss of Christmas. Was this difficult? I know it's a huge thing for people who aren't, for a lot of people who aren't Jewish. Was this something that you found difficult to give up? I am definitely an exception. Okay. And I I tell people, so I don't even share this with conversion students because I don't want to influence anyone's beliefs or anything. Um, But I was angry about Christmas. You were angry about Christmas? Oh, yeah. By the time I was converting, I was just like, oh, that old thing? <laughs> like, I would feel the rage simmer up at the beginning of October when they started playing Christmas music in the mm. stores because it, I'd found this thing that I loved that felt completely mine and completely me. And I felt like when, when Christmas would come out, Mm-hmm. It was challenging this new light <laughs> I had found, found that I that I wanted yeah. to shine. Yeah, um, I was like, no, there are other options. Don't you know there are other options? I I felt like I was running around like a uh, screaming to the townspeople. There are other choices, um, and I was taking it out on Christmas, and it was completely misplaced. I fought with my family. I was like, I don't want to take a photo in front of the tree. I don't want to exchange gifts on that day. I. This is the wrong position, I Christmas will say. Can, Christmas <laughs> can be very overwhelming in America, and it becomes a lot. And I feel like Christmas is – some people who are, are, live their lives more secular, it's like becomes the only religious thing they do. Even if it's not religious, it becomes their whole personality. Right. right. Um, so I can understand the anger about that. I was making it I, – I was totally deflecting. It wasn't about Christmas. It was about struggling to feel legitimate. In the tradition that I had chosen, that everybody I knew knew that I had chosen, um, that I felt very green. I felt like, you know, I've only been I'm, I'm a Jewish two year old. Yeah. You know, like what what how am I going to have anybody respect me and understand that my holidays, my life cycle is different? You want you can't just include me now in these other things that. Even if you're a secular person observing Christmas, it is a Christian tradition. People who are not Christian can participate in Christian traditions. But that doesn't mean that the thing that means the thing yeah. now means something more universalistic. Today, what I say is Christmas is beautiful. Giving gifts is important. The lights are stunning. The Especially music's New York. gorgeous. New York, oh, New York New Christmas. New York does Christmas the best. Yes. It, it, it is beautiful. Um, I grew up with like six Christmas trees in the house. That's, we would decorate them. It took so weeks. That's so obscene about Christmas oh, yeah. trees. And you know what is and most beautiful? And were you finding pine, pine needles until April? Yes. Eventually my mom changed to like fancy pre-lit like, yes. the plastic trees, yeah. which are a lot easier to handle. Um, but it, it, it is absolutely beautiful. And the thing is I didn't yet know how to make it feel like Christmas, the warmth, the happiness, the family togetherness, the matching sweaters, the warm drinks, the the tradition, the songs. Yeah. I didn't yet know how to do that in Judaism. Mm. And so the reminder of Christmas and that I had done that before and I'd found this piece and I was now, you know, kind of floating, trying to figure out my way. I took out that rage on Christmas. Had nothing to do with Christmas. That was my personal war on Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> so there is a war on Christmas. It's just your personal war. We're dropping all kinds of things. I feel out there like for though being an American Jew, it is 
it's a difficult thing because it's such an all-encompassing season. And it is like, hey, this too. And I know Hanukkah, which I'm going to be doing an episode, has become very commercialized to kind of combat. Be like, hey, we can do ugly sweaters. We can do <laughs> Hanukkah gingerbread houses and Hanukkah bushes. But I think the holiday season for Jews is kind of – it's just kind of weird in general living in America and it being such a commercialized and overemphasized time of the year. It is. So you have a bachelor's in women's studies, which I think is pretty rare for a man. What made you decide to do choose that as a major? Indeed. Uh, out of the nine graduates the year I graduated in that college, only two of us were men. First of all, I wanted to do something different. Before I knew I wanted to be a clergy person, I thought I wanted to be a senator. Um, so it not hard to see how the singer-songwriter thing was really only <laughs> sparking a part of my love. And I loved theory, and I wanted to understand myself better. I wanted to understand sexuality. I wanted to understand how it influences the way we interact with the world. And I was convinced, based on what I loved about the Torah, that there was going to be enough in there about relationships and you know how we position ourselves with the divine— because everything that we have in our culture that's anti-woman, anti-LGBTQ, anti-other, a lot of our anti-black tradition comes from a place of religiosity. Yeah. And it's not because religion said these are the right things. It is because someone with bigoted ideas realized religion is a powerful tool. Um, and I wanted to be someone who could be on the inside, be in religion, work in religion— and use the the tools of liberation to access religion in a in a more holistic way. And I thought, who better to go in and tell a whole bunch of Jewish people about how exciting Judaism is than somebody who chose it three years ago? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I thought, you know what? If I'm not going to feel like I'm doing it wrong because I'm not doing Jewish the way my grandma did, what have I got to lose? Yeah. And so I went into this women's sexuality and gender studies program and I said, hey, do you think there's a chance I can do an independent study with a Jewish focus? And they said, what do you mean? And I said, well, I read this really cool stuff in this compendium of legal Jewish ethics called the Mishnah that talks about the diversity of genders in ancient society. And they said, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, we've never heard anything like that. And they let me run with it. Wow. And and so it, it got to be this intensely Jewish, um, very gender expansive period of study. Um, and it helped me understand my own defensivenesses, the things that I respond to from society. When I when I hear, you know, a homophobic slur, instead of now responding in a place that is, no, I'm not that, it's, okay, What, where does that come from? Where does that idea come from? How are they failing to know me? And then, of course, I'm still thinking, oh, yeah. well, well, well yeah. they're idiots. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, I still get very angry about it. But realizing that I wanted to know what made society this way. And so women's studies is a way of bringing anthropology, sociology, and psychology together um, and just saying, well, here's our best estimation of how we got here. That's so interesting. I'm obsessed with Holocaust history mm. and education, and a lot of the books I've read are about, you know, leading up to why people feel this way. Mm -hmm. But I guess I've never really thought about other marginalized groups. That's so interesting. Yeah. So talk me through when you decided to become a member of the clergy. Mm. Um, growing up, I thought I wanted to be uh, if not, you know, some kind of a politician, a youth pastor, you know, I, it was the only model I knew from movies. I didn't know anything else about clergy other than, you know, like the priests were a thing. Um, but when I got more involved Jewishly, I realized that, you know, the cantorate specifically was going to combine my love of music, my love of pastoral care, you know, the moments we get to be with people and celebrate them or mourn with them. Um, so music, pastoral care, and lifelong learning. I wanted to have an excuse to surround myself with books 
and just get lost in arcane knowledge. <laughs> That's what I wanted. There's a little bit of it that felt like Harry Potter. <laughs> I wanted to be pronouncing these blessings and connecting with people and finding meaningful ways to mark our time on earth. I had spent time with people who tried to give me answers and I realized there's so much more joy and power in helping people discover their questions. There's no other way to do that. And I didn't want to be a, a therapist. <laughs> so it, this just it, but your job it made does sense. kind of entail a little bit of that. No, we we refer out when when things are above our pay grade. Yeah, um, <laughs> you got to be very careful, um, of course. But it, you know, I, I wanted to feel things with people and experience things with people because it helps punctuate your own existence. It's an incredible privilege when someone comes into your office and cries about what they're feeling. It's an incredible privilege when you stand with an entire family um, with a 13-year-old who talks about their Holocaust survivor grandparent and how reading the Torah is an act of defiance in the modern age. Or burying a Holocaust survivor and holding a family that knows that now there's so much more weight on their shoulders to keep the story going. It must have been at least a hundred years We must have cried an ocean an ocean of tears We wandered through the coldest darkest night And you were waiting for me there A spark of light Forever is a long long Long, long time My beloved, I am yours And you are mine Do di li Fa ani lo ha roe Fa Never seen the colors quite so bright. I never held another quite so tight. I never felt my heart could fly away. I can't believe I get to be with you every single day. Forever is a long, 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 long time. My beloved, I am yours, and you are mine. Do di li ba ni lo ha. Don't 
I get to play active and passive roles in so many people's lives, and and I just wanted to be someone who could sort of help them organize the emotions and the spirituality around them. Because I mean, God knows I can't organize anything in my personal life. <laughs> <laughs> it's least so much you can control. <laughs> So walk me through the process of from kind of start to finish of becoming an ordained cantor in mm. the reform movement. So the first step, you get an undergraduate degree of some kind, um, then you apply for school. Cantors and rabbis in the reform movement go to the same school. Um, it's a five-year program where you get a master's degree and then you write a thesis and then you get ordained. Um, the first year now for rabbis and cantors for like the last, I, th I think, like 25, 20 years maybe, um, the first year is in Jerusalem. So that's where you, you know, learn Hebrew, study text, get deeply into the practice of the calendar and, and all of that. You learn the liturgy. Um, and then you spend four years in one of the stateside campuses. Um, we just Cincinnati's in the process of closing, so that was one of the options. But now it's it's going to be L.A. and New York, and you spend four more years taking graduate level courses, ranging from rabbinic text, Bible, classical repertoire. So like chanting the things that you hear the golden age cantors chanting. We have to learn all of that. You know, we have to learn how to daven a traditional service. Um, there's like a year long workshop that covers just the liturgy of Rosh Hashanah and how to chant it. There's a year for Yom Kippur. And then, you know, you learn how to do things like funerals and weddings. So you get, you get, a, lot of, you get a lot of book learning. There's a lot of very cool theoretical stuff that you do. Uh, and then there's a bunch of practice because you have to somehow cram music school because you didn't have to major in music yeah. to go to cantorial school. It just means that you're glutton for punishment if you do what I did. <laughs> I was just on a panel with prospective students uh, a couple of weeks ago, and they were like, do I need to major in music? I said, no. But are you good at music right now? Because if not, this is going to be a slog. Like, it is, it's a lot of work. You graduate with close to, like, 200 hours. You get to learn a little bit of everything, but it sets you up to know what are the things that you're going to study for the rest of your career. And and so it's, it's formative. You By the end of the process, you know what your passions are. Um, and you know what kind of service job you want. And most cantors today end up in congregational settings. And I knew that's what I wanted. I wanted to work at a large congregation with a big history and uh, an amazing team. And so for me, it was, you know, when this job came up and I met this clergy team, I was like, okay, well, I'm in. Uh, if y'all are in, it's like it, like sending a little note that says, uh, circle yes. Yes, sir, sure it's no. yes, yes for you. Uh, <laughs> It's like I wanted to write them a song and email it to them <laughs> <laughs> and then not pick up the phone just in case. <laughs> it is a big deal finding, you know, a lot of people spend their entire careers in one place. So it's, mm -hmm. it is like finding a life partner, finding the right congregation that you oh, fit yeah. in. Yeah. You have, to, you have to be able to serve the people what they need and, and, and know when to step back and – not make it about yourself. What is the drop rate at school? That's an excellent question. Um, because it is such a involved process. I think a lot of people probably enter it not realizing how much work it is or you know, I think not so. a good fit. A good – so it's, it's already a pretty small selective group of people that choose to go to seminary like of any kind. And so then when you have the Jewish seminaries, that's even smaller. When you have the reform one – it's an even smaller, smaller group. So I think in my year, for example, across all campuses, we had 45 students. Okay. And that's the cantorial and rabbinical process and the education route. Um, and I think at the end of it, I think somewhere between 35 and 38 of us were ordained. It, it, there's, there's a little bit of a drop off. It's mostly people realizing this isn't what I wanted to do because, you know, half of us entered – before we even knew who we were. It 
just that's how school works. Yeah. It, you know, it's 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 grad school. And then, you know, there are, of course, people who don't make it through. And I think that is also because it wasn't the right fit. Because, you know, if you, like I tell the students rather flippantly, if there's nothing else <laughs> that you can do, that means everything's pointing you toward this. And if all of these things, all of these various paths of the clergy are are what are going to fulfill you, keep refilling your cup, and make you someone who can always be giving, then there's nothing else that's going to be able to do that for you, and you have to you have to find a way through. And the school will work with you. There are people who you know add an extra year, go through it that way. You know, it is a really grueling process. But I think it has to be. You have to be fully formed and able to articulate who you are before you can step in and and help people and, and, lead and celebrate them. them. Yeah, yeah. Even as something as simple as celebrating people, you have to be able to show up and love them, and you have to have sorted out your own issues before that. So a few months ago, you put on a concert. So how did that come about, and how did you choose the theme and the material? So one of the requirements for ordination in the cantorial program is a senior recital. And Oh, that's fun. And it it would have been except that mine was scheduled during the pandemic. Oh, that's not fun. Yeah. And so I had big plans to do, you know, multi-genre. I wanted a band and and I wanted um other people to sing with me and all of a sudden my option became Zoom or recording with just a pianist in one side of a room and me on the other side and nothing I wanted to do, none of the repertoire that I had dreamed of worked that way. I wanted to lift up queer art and art that spoke to queer people, meaning stuff that has like become queer, you know, because like, for example, Barbara Streisand, um, queer icon, not actually queer. Yeah. Uh, and yet who would ever question? Of course not. <laughs> you know? um, and I, I wanted to celebrate the music that informed the people who did all of this before me so that I could be this, you know, naive young queer person who was going to go out and become a clergy person and save the world and be there for other little queer kids, you know. Um, but it, it really was a here's the music that got everyone else through. And these are our these are our fight songs, our pride songs, our very powerful moments and i wanted to show that you can make it religious music by sharing the intent that was under it everything in the liturgy is supposed to arouse something in us it is supposed to bring us closer to god or each other or creation um and and all of this was the same you know any any song that i pick off of this list like goodbye yellow brick road we're looking at elton john acknowledging this this divergence in his life in which he had to choose do i continue to do this thing which isn't necessarily the easy path because his, his life was killing him or am i going to brave the wild and be me i mean that it's it's the most apt metaphor for coming out and and so it was, it was stuff like that you know come to my window um the first like super out bridge that said, I don't care what they think. What do they know about this love anyway? Things like that before we were even a blip on anyone's political radar. Things that were defiant um, and important. Things that I want our queer kids today to be proud about. There's no chill and yet I shiver there's no flame, and yet I burn. I'm not sure what I'm afraid of, and yet I'm trembling. There's no storm, yet I hear thunder, and I'm breathless why I wonder. Weak one moment, then the next. I'm fine I feel as if I'm falling every time I close my eyes 
and flowing through my body is a river of surprise. Feelings are awakening I hardly recognize as mine. What are all these new sensations? What's the secret they reveal? I'm not sure I understand, but I like the way I feel. Why is it that every time I close my eyes, he's there? water shining on his skin, the sunlight in his hair. And all the while I'm thinking things that I can't wait to share with him. I'm a bundle of confusion, yet it has a strange appeal. Did it all begin? And the way he makes me feel, I like the way he makes me feel. How did you end up having the concert here? Mm. So when I couldn't do it through school, um, I, I was actually really annoying, I'm sure, to the administration of my school. And I said, look, that format is not going to work for what I want to pull off. And I'm confident that I can pull this off. I just need time. I just need a postponement until I can do this right live way. somewhere. And so my school was like, okay, you know, we're fine. We think you're trying to find a way out of this. Um, but they said yes. And so I dove into the thesis. And then when I was here, I brought it up one day. And this incredible, incredible clergy team um, and our amazing operations folks and our communications folks realized this could be something really cool, really big. And so they decided to co-sponsor my senior recital with the school. And, um, you know, I wanted to celebrate this place, too. You know, Congregation Road of Shalom is one of the first congregations in the country to employ out queer people. Um, and I wanted to honor that because it that's why I'm here. It's the people of this community that kept me in New York. Uh, how does being a gay man inform your faith? And how does being Jewish inform your identity as a gay man? Ooh, <laughs> love the way that's worded. I've never been asked that way. Um, so... They are both part of like a composite lens. Um, being a gay person means being something that people feel like they understand because there is, you know, the the same desire to find love, live life, do the do this. But then understanding that everything that's been built in society wasn't built for you, wasn't built on your assumptions. Something as simple and innocuous as um, Having to tell a contractor who's going to be in my apartment doing some work that I won't be there, but my husband will be. And just anticipating that on the other end of the line, this stranger might think, feel, say whatever it is that they're going to say that's prompted by this. That is just a fact about who I am. So you're always a little bit, um, no, I am <laughs> always a little bit on edge and doing the most that I can to make sure that I'm not preemptively defensive about anything. Um, you know, I, I lived in a city, so I didn't experience the the grossest homophobia. But I, I you know, I worked in childcare and I was told, you know, parents would be more comfortable if you don't hug the children here. Um, and, you know, being told that, you know, um, we can respect that you and Alex, my husband, love each other and want to live together, but it's, you know, it's just not the same as a marriage. And like those are those are small ish things. But every part of that contributes to your worthiness. And so my 
my love of Judaism is this idea that everything that was created, everything that exists now, is an ongoing process that we're involved in. And I love the idea that being Jewish is also being very different. The world is also not built for Jews. The world is not built by Jews. And knowing that I was becoming part of a community of people who were already used to living in the margins yeah. makes the whole, it, it permeates the literature. It permeates it at the biblical level because we were just, you know, wanderers. There weren't Abrahamic faiths yet. We are still figuring out how not to just be warring clans of violent people. And then, you know, it permeates the after the destruction of the temple. We get to see how Jewish law comes about by people who were so scared of what could befall them. And then after that, we have literature built on folk practices and traditions that developed in hostile host na- nations. And I said, well, how profoundly comfortable that is to me as someone who knew they were gay in South Texas at eight. I distinctly remember being called slurs by grown men because I represented something that scared them, something that they didn't understand. And that ignorance... reminds me of the ignorance that I encounter wearing a kippah, which I chose and choose actively to do. It is a name tag. I choose to be very publicly Jewish because it's not a skin I want to be able to take off. And getting to see how people will come to you out of ignorance in that way too, all built on their fears, all built on their assumptions, For me, they're very similar lenses and experiences, and they are what make me fight and push back to make all of this worth it. And when you do, you get to see what you're fighting for and what really matters. You know, I think queer people face, you know, the the worst fear of coming out is that you'll lose the people you love. And once you're willing to make that decision, you get really good at cutting things out of your life. I was very lucky I got to keep all of the people who really mattered to me. But I don't have second cousins because of this. And that is painful. And yet it also made me appreciate more all the people who stayed. And it's the same with anything else in my life since. Knowing that, yeah, okay, I cut out Christmas. And I'm not saying that everyone who converts (laughs) needs to do that. Please don't, if you love it. But it made me make sense of all of my Jewish options and really dive in deep. And I found great appreciation in so many things that I would never have picked up if I didn't need to. What importance do you think there is in having gay clergy to Jewish queer youth? Mm. I wish I'd had some. Um, I think every time there's a queer person who can stand up and be an adult who's allowed to talk to children, it is showing children that we are okay, that we are safe. Every time I wear a kippah in a gay bar in New York City, everyone in the room with religious trauma finds me. (laughs) (laughs) What? Um, Because they want to talk to me about how I am possibly both of these things in this space. Mm. And it is because religion, again, has is a tool that can be used by people with horrible beliefs, but is not inherently that. And yet the vast majority of us have been at the mercy of someone who's using that tool for that purpose. And so, like, I I help them... um, no, I, I just listen. I don't actually do, you don't anything. Have to do anything. I don't have to do anything. So you're still able to just kind of like sip your drink and yeah, you know, you know I'm you know doing my thing. You're like and I just wanted to go out on Thursday. Yeah, you know, I really, I really should know by now after seven years of doing this in New York. Um, but it, it it's amazing to then 
hear people over and over come to the conclusion, oh, that was people. It wasn't religion. It wasn't religion. Yeah. or it, And it could have been one particular sect's professed beliefs, but that is also not religion. <laughs> like, you can always go further back and find what something could have been or should have been. And honestly, there are so many options out there that, like, just saying that because of one organization or another that, you know, you can't be queer and religious is nonsense. What we need to be more comfortable with is if you don't want to be religious, you have found connection elsewhere. Religion is just one way to connect to something beyond yourself. And for too long, it has been um, closed to queer people because we present um, another option you know, if you want to live a, in a world in which we are literally just parallels of biblical people, well, they weren't people doing what they wanted to do. And so it makes sense that you would create a rigid version of a society that only allowed for a man and a woman and children and and this and this and that. And so when I get to, you know, teach a group of fifth graders about the Torah and I get to stand there as a gay man and talk about, well, you know, my husband and I were studying this passage, it shows them that, oh, this actually can apply. Like, we can we can glean wisdom in the way that the ancient sages did. There was nobody in the year 200 in the Middle East whose life resembled ours. If they can get something out of this document, so can we, and we're not obligated to try to come to the same conclusions or even have the same process. And And I think having queer clergy... Um, and specifically gay male clergy um, is an important way to defy conceptions that anybody has to be any particular way. Like, I can use my male privilege in this space to subvert the notions of masculinity and do it in a way that I'm basing it on my understanding of God and the Torah and mostly just encouraging everyone to do, do it their way. That's what we have to do. That's why it's so hard to be Jewish, is that you have to figure out your way. So yeah, they should see me struggle, and I hope that encourages them to do the same. Come to my window Crawl inside and wait by the light of the moon Come to my window I'll be home soon dial the numbers just to listen to your breath and I would stand inside my hell and hold the hand of death but you don't know how far I'd go to ease this precious ache and you don't know how much I'd give or how much I can take just to reach you just to reach you Promises I know that I can't keep Nothing fills the blackness that has seeped into my chest I need you in my blood I am forsaking all the rest Just to reach you Just to reach you I don't care what they 
they know about this love anyway? Come, come, come to my window. I'll be home, I'll be home. So you visited India in 2019. What was that like? And can you tell me about the Jewish community there that you discovered? Mm -hmm. Um, I will say, first of all, it was the most incredible, just beautiful place. Um, I've only, I, I only went to Mumbai and a city called Cochin in the south in the state of Kerala. Um, This was with a trip run by um, JDC Entwine. That's the Joint Distribution Committee. Um, they have just for ages protected, established, um, and connected Jewish communities across the world to make sure that we know just how many versions of us there are out there. Um, Which is very important work. Right. Like it, it goes in with what you were talking about earlier that, you know, you, we can actually expand our own understanding of all of this when we look at the ways that other people are doing the same thing that we're doing. Um, So this was a trip organized um, by the JDC, and it took, I think, 20 American clergy students and put us with 20 Israelis and 20 Indian Jews. And we went through Jewish Mumbai. We saw the sites of where they had the attacks I think they. I, th- I think it was there. I think it was seven eleven when it happened for them. It was like it was like their. It was a, it was a terror attack. Some um, some terror cell from Pakistan had come in and wreaked havoc for a while in the city, um, and so we got to see what that looked like and how it is still rippling out in the community. And people are still grappling this with this um, in a place where Jews lived in peace in their host nation is the only country in the world that never persecuted its Jewish population. India, really? India. And so holding those two truths, seeing like standing in the sight of this anti-Jewish terror attack and learning about how this how is a host nation. How long ago was that terrorist attack? Oh, gosh, that's something that I should absolutely know. It was in the last 20 years, last 15, maybe. In my head, 10 years ago was the 90s. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah you don't need to tell me. Okay, so it was in 2008. Ah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, and that just, that feels so bizarrely modern. Like, that's Obama era. Yeah. Like, that's that's crazy to think about. Um, and so, you know, that was one of the settings. And then we went to the south um, to this city called Cochin, where they have a street called um, Jewtown. <laughs> And it is because it was a big, thriving Jewish community. The Jewish community in India is like 4,800 years old or something. That's, that's a little old. It, it, it's Just a like, little old. And I'm, don't ever quote me on numbers. I, I'm not the history or numbers person. The idea is they'd lived in peace. They got to flourish. There were multiple different communities that came up with their their own flourishes on Jewish practice. Incredibly tight-knit um, and, you know, they lived side by side with the mostly Hindu um, community. What struck me the most about the trip was that we got to tour these old synagogues that aren't used by Jews anymore. Um, there are, I, I think right now, 4,500 Jews left in India. The um, community continues to make Aliyah to Israel, um, and otherwise they mostly live in Mumbai. But these synagogues are an absolute pristine condition 
because they are lovingly and pridefully taken care of by the Hindu folks who live in those communities. And when we would come through, people would be so excited to be like, I, I, I work here to clean it and keep it beautiful every day. And all I have wanted was for a Jewish community to come in and pray. And I was just, I was like, what are you talking? I've never, I've never encountered that. You want me to come here and pray. <laughs> <laughs> they want the Jews to come. You want Jews. Um, yeah, that's not usually the, uh, how people feel about Jews. Yeah. And um, to hear how these other young Jews experienced being Jewish in India and, you know, it it's such a cliche, but finding out how similar we all are. Yeah. It, it was it was amazing. Gosh, I, I want to go back. I will never I will never forget how incredible a Shabbat dinner is in India. What did you eat? Oh my gosh. I mean the best versions of all of your favorite food at your favorite Indian restaurant. Oh my gosh. Um, I cle- clearly writing down a trip to India to visit the Indian Jews. Yes. Yes. Oh, that's so cool. I mean, that's even... I already think it's so cool when you have a cuisine that decides to go kosher because that's so fascinating to me. And if you're not Jewish and you own the business, you can actually be open on Shabbat and still be kosher, which is just even more incredible because who doesn't want more kosher food available on Saturdays? (laughs) But um, to have it be people who whose, whose stories start in India and are bringing it here, it's just... it's. It's incredible to see how expansive and just beautiful Judaism is wherever it finds a home. And all the music was so similar. That That's what's funny. Today they, they sing a lot of the music that we do. I couldn't really figure out why and I would ask questions. I was like, you know, was this my assumption coming from the West and, and being a white person was, oh, okay, this must be considered more legitimate and you have either subconsciously taken this on or it's been forced on you. Um, and I don't think that's the case. It sounds like when folks there travel, they pick they're stuff exposed up that to things like. that they love. Yes. Yeah. And so they're only doing things they love. And I'm just like, oh, okay, that's that's the best. Um, but that's something I would love to study and be more involved in the community and learn about. My only Shabbat experiences there were with a traditional community who didn't use instruments. Okay. And so it was, um, that was exactly what I was looking for and was very curious about. I wanted to see how the particularities of Indian music, you know, for example, using something like a Shruti box that's going to get that beautiful drone sound going throughout a whole piece. And you can hear how you move tonally through uh, a piece, even with this one note being like this incredible acoustic hum you feel through your body. But they don't use that yeah. on Shabbat. They were, more, um, they were observant and didn't. For those of you that don't know, you're not technically, I, I don't even, this is a weird way, you're not supposed to use musical instruments on Shabbat. Yeah. However, I love services with music, so I'm a little biased in regards to the observancy of that. <laughs> well, it comes from a prohibition of changing a string. You're not allowed to do the repairing act that would have been like part of creation. So like you can't play a lyre or a, a guitar today, because if you broke a string, you might be inclined to oh, change it. Oh, I thought it, it specifically had to do with the act of playing the instruments, not the pairing. That's very so interesting. So it, it's presented that way, and yet if we look at the Psalms, we played all the instruments in the temple. Like worship required choruses and instruments, and and all of this. Um, it became when we started, uh, like after the destruction of the temple, we wanted to make sure we were never transgressing any of the commit- the commandments. And so we built fences around them. So it's not that climbing a tree is forbidden on Shabbat. It's that breaking a twig is forbidden. And so to avoid breaking a twig, you cannot climb a tree. This is the same way. So to make sure that you're not repairing something, you can't play the instrument because if you you know, puncture the drum, you might want to go tan some hide and refashion your drum. You might, it's... Which clearly we would be doing in 2023. I'm like, what makes you think I wouldn't have a whole arsenal of <laughs> instruments? And I was like, oh, okay, we broke a string. All right, Here's picking up the fender. Guitar. Here it's we like, go. You know, it's like the Olympic skiers take like 30 pairs of skis. Exactly. It's like I have 15 guitars just waiting on yeah. the Bima for me. I mean, there there are two guitars just in this room, and I don't lead services in here, so we would be we would be well covered. 
Yeah. <laughs> I learned something new every time I talk to somebody. I love that I because I thought it was literally just the playing of the music. Yeah. And I mean, there there might be another interpretation, too. Um, but the like the prohibition comes from the what would you do because of this? And so if you eliminate that and now that that is such an ingrained thing, culturally, you'd have a whole bunch of people who'd be extremely turned off by music on Shabbat. And so it would be like earth shattering. You know, when we uh, in seminary in the, the year in Israel, um, the cantorial and rabbinical students lead a service in Jerusalem. And, and for a long time, it was the only high holiday service in the country where you would have someone playing piano and we had instruments. And so people would come as guests for the novelty. People who had never in their lives been to synagogue and then also very traditional people would come because they'd be like, what do you mean? What do you mean there? It's Yom Kippur. You can lie on the street. What do you mean someone over here is playing piano? Like this doesn't make sense with our cultural uh, understanding of what this day means. And so, like, I, I totally, totally understand that. But I personally, and this is going to sound mean, I'm so bored um, when there is no musical instruments. I remember because I grew up in a conservative synagogue, people with pitch pipes. And I was, I was like, yeah. I first exposed to that. And I was also in the children's choir. And I was like, this is weird. I, I, yeah. I, I, I like music. You have to be, like, virtuosic to be singers who don't need music it's it, also harder to sing it's much harder you know and i feel like you know you would these people have like perfect pitch that they were just always magnificent singers with no music no 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 <laughs> no like so. the short answer is no and that's why there's like the congregational slide things just change pitch slowly 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 <laughs> but also if no one's recording no it's true it's it's always like when it's like when a group of people sing happy birthday, it's like mm-hmm. pick a note, pick pick a key, pick a key. And then yeah. people will just change and Yep. Yeah. And I'm always like naively hoping that everyone's just going to coalesce around one so, of the keys. Um, so on another <laughs> note, I do like when people in the congregation naturally harmonize with each yes. other, which I really like. That is a There's treat. a couple of prayers where that just automatically happens. And I love those moments. But yeah, you you I, I really enjoy the musical aspect. Oh, yeah. Did your husband move with you to Jerusalem? Yep. He took that plunge and he got a job at the library of the seminary before I was officially accepted. Oh. Because he knew that, you know, we would still need to be (laughs) paying for food. Yeah. Um, So, yeah, I mean, he was uh, and is still just a big time go getter. Who I love that, that you possible. had that support. I feel like, especially if you hadn't spent time out of the country, that could be a very, it's a very different lifestyle. And because you're in the middle of all of that, um, it would be a little, it could be a little isolating, especially because yeah. it's the first year and you don't necessarily know anybody going there. And it was such a sink or swim moment for me because like my first attempt at, at college before the singer songwriter era was such a um, objective failure that I was, you know, just terrified of putting all of my eggs in one basket and then going to the Middle East, um, speaking a language that I'd only learned for a year um, and doing that. And he sacrificed a lot to come with me. Um, He put his own stuff on hold to work in a library um, to help pay for groceries while I was studying in Jerusalem. And then he did the same thing. He got a job in New York uh, before I even started school um, so that we could pay rent and do our thing. It wouldn't be here without him. It's so great to have such a supportive partner, especially when it's um, especially when it's something, you know, it's not like you were going through medical school or law school where there was necessarily going to be a big payoff. Yeah, yeah. You like know, clergy, security it, clergy for sure, but. infamously overpaid, obviously. <laughs> so there is a conservative synagogue in Los Angeles, which I will not name names, where someone left a huge endowment. I don't know if he's still the head rabbi, but the head rabbi made a million dollars a year. Wow. Which, like, wow. is insane. It's insane. It's like the, the part of me that, like, screams for ethics is just like, oh, no, how could you? And then the jealous part of me is just like, <laughs> girl. I'm making a million dollars a year as a rabbi is... I feel like it's almost like the anti-clergy salary. Yeah. Like, you, not yeah. that like you know you're a Catholic priest where you're supposed to live in poverty, but it's like you shouldn't be making a million dollars yeah. a year. Though 
to that congregation, maybe they are worth a million dollars a year. You know, I like to think that I'm worth a billion. Um, but <laughs> part of that knowledge is knowing that I would never ask for anything close. <laughs> it's true. Is there anything else you want to talk about or say or any messages you have for anybody who might be listening? Um, yeah. You know, um, I use this corny metaphor all the time um, about Judaism being a buffet. And what's so important about conversations like this is just that it's one more voice out there that's saying you're an active participant in your own religious life and there's no one way to do anything ever in any tradition. Um, And the scariest part is deciding that you are going to try something. Um, And so if I could give one message to anybody listening, it's try it. Do something. Do, Do one thing. Ask somebody, uh, you know, It's interesting that you say that because I feel like even things that are very traditional and how I grew up with, like, for example, Shabbat, sometimes it can feel like imposter syndrome a little bit, you know, like lighting the candles. You're like, but I'm not like super observant. What right do I have to do this? So I feel like it's a very valid point. For sure. And, you know, the hard work after you do it is figuring out what in the world it means. But that can come later. You can figure out what it means and why you're doing it along the way. Just try the thing. And if it doesn't fit, we've got more to try on for you. So this last portion of the show, I kind of equate it to the actor's studio. I even stole some of their questions. It's just kind of like short form questions that I ask all of my guests. So what is your favorite Yiddish word? You can throw in Hebrew word too, because I know you probably know a lot of those. Um... Recently, I've really loved the word spilkies. Um, Rabbi Deborah Goldberg taught me that term when we were talking about our our two year olds to kindergarten yes. age kids. She's yes. like, "Okay, do we need to stand up and get the spilkies Spil- out?" Spilkies out, yeah. And now that is like very much um, just how I feel at the end of my work day. Yeah, uh, I'm always saying that word in my head. Yeah. What about a, a Hebrew word that you your fa- a Hebrew a favorite word. He- favorite Hebrew word? Oh, a favorite Hebrew word. Um, Oh, wow. I don't want to sound basic. Um, (laughs) Sometimes (laughs) things are basic for a reason. Um, You know, the first thing that comes to mind is like Kifkef, the brand of like Israeli Kit Kat. That's so fun. It's called Kifkef? Yeah. I love that so much. (laughs) Fun, fun. I love that. Uh, What is your favorite Jewish holiday? Oh, Sukkot, for sure. Anytime you can like build a fort and then sleep in it and eat beautiful foods and decorate it, like that's that's my jam right there. If you were to have a bar mitzvah today, what would the theme of your party be? Oh, you know, I, I think it would have to be Lady Gaga. Like I'm thinking <laughs> like up until art pop. Um, like, <laughs> that's very specific. Like fame monster, because like I, I want to go back to like my high school days, um, and that would definitely be my theme. I want to come out and like just a bunch of sparkly bead work, um, bustier moment. Uh, That's definitely a party a totally... I would want to go to. I, I, like, please invite me to this bar mitzvah. <laughs> well, God willing, coming soon to Congregation Road of Shalom, the Cantor's bar mitzvah. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> really. There's some talk. That's so that, okay, we can splice this in. So we never actually talked about this. So did you have like a actual bar mitzvah after you converted? No, no. After I converted, the next thing that was slated for my congregation was adult confirmation. Okay. So I did that instead and it was amazing. Um, But I have promised all of my students and there I've had like 90 B'nai mitzvah at this point. And I've promised them that I will do one as well on that very uh, intimidating Bima. And I might even wear heels in honor of all of our amazing Banot Mitzvah who can carry the Torah that way. So we'll you know, see. We'll that's see. a legitimate thing. And I was reading something on Instagram about the myth of the, the congregation having to fast for 40 days if the Torah gets ah, dropped. Yeah. That it's yeah. not, that's not a real thing, but I've heard that some congregations, they will split up the fast. So it ends up mm-hmm. being that people don't fast individually for 40 days, but it's 40 oh, yeah. days collectively. Which yeah. it's very terrifying. I every time I would have to hold the Torah, I it, it's really terrifying. Yeah. So I was happy to know that that's not like a real thing where I would cause people to starve to death if I dropped it. 
it makes me double it makes me rethink my um off color <laughs> joke at rehearsals when i tell the kid like okay uh now don't drop the torah but don't worry if you do i'm not fasting i'm gonna make all of your guests <laughs> <laughs> So that's so funny. Well, if if when you do have your bar mitzvah, I will be there for the service and I will yeah. throw candy at you if you're if, <laughs> though there's some people who like don't like that the candy throwing thing. So going back to our questions, what profession other than your own would you want to attempt? Uh, for a long time, I thought I wanted to be a senator. Oh, really? And I'm still, you know, I, I love politics. I'm a news junkie and I would still love to like give some sort of public service um, thing like that a shot, but I don't know. I think I found something where I get to more talk about the joy and fix society in spiritual ways. Um, but yeah, that always, that always appealed to me. I love the idea of working on legislation and affecting change, but the demands were a little bit different and I don't really want to be a lawyer. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, I can't imagine being a politician. It's just constant everything. Always. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. All right. And our last one is if heaven is real and God is there to welcome you, what would you like to hear them say? Oh, what a fun question. Um, my hope is that just like some of my favorite songs from my childhood start playing um, and God just says, hey, there's a great taco bar in the back. Uh, and here is a terrific dirty martini. Uh, and we go from there. And it's just moment by moment. I think yours is probably the most my favorite answer that we've gotten to that so far, because I do <laughs> honestly like the music from your childhood. Like, I love the idea of being like welcomed with this therapeutic, emotional music that would oh, make yeah. you feel calm. And the, who doesn't love a taco bar? I know. I mean, the crazy thing is the album would be Jagged Little Pill, so I'm not sure how <laughs> calming that is. Um, but not maybe not therapeutic, nostalgic, <laughs> more than therapeutic. The oh, 90s on, apathetic, wrong. you know, yeah. rock. Thank you so much for joining me. This has been lovely. So this has been uh, Nicole with Sheba in the City. I think it's time we found a way back home. You lose so many things you love as you grow I miss the days when I was just a kid My fear became my shadow, I swear it did Wherever is your heart, I call home Wherever is your heart, I call home Though your feet may take you far from me, I know Wherever is your heart, I call home You made me feel like I was always falling Always falling down without a place to land
forgive my mind Oh God, forgive my mind When I come home When I come home Oh God, forgive my mind There's a road that's long and winding It hollers home I'm calling home Oh God, forgive my mind Oh God, forgive my mind When I come home When I come home Oh God, forgive my mind Oh God, forgive my mind When I come home To Road of Charlotte Stefano Iacono, everyone.